Sherlock Gnomes is a movie that was released. I guess so many people were clamoring for a sequel to... Uh, Gnomeo and Juliet. Seven years later, a bunch of panicked executives got together after realizing their animated movie ideas drawer was completely empty and as a result, greenlit this. The original film had a tiny budget for an animated movie of only $36 million and somehow made a whopping $193 million worldwide for some reason. I guess gnomes were popular in 2011 or something? I didn't realise these films were so ridiculously English. All of you viewers outside of the UK must assume that us Brits love David Beckham, The Beatles, Fish and Chips, and I guess gnomes? I don't think I've ever actually seen a garden gnome in person before. Who owns them? They're the most tasteless, kitschy, unattractive looking things and I don't understand why anyone likes them. Let alone why anyone would think that it would be a good idea to make not one movie, but two movies about garden gnomes. Well, three if you count Gnome Alone, which I guess was trying to cash in on some of that gnome blood money. I'm Liam, strong and silent. I like it. Oh, and how could I forget Gnomes and Trolls? The secret chamber. Am I in a living nightmare right now, or is what I'm looking at somehow a real movie? Anyway, I'll have to save that one for another time. Romeo and Juliet was pretty bad on its own. It's quite literally a beat-for-beat -beat retelling of Romeo and Juliet, except the characters are garden gnomes. The scene where Juliet commits suicide after Romeo poisons himself seemed a little much for a kid's movie though. At the time of me writing this, I watched the first movie a day ago, and I remember nothing about it aside from an annoying frog commenting on how Juliet has a huge ass. Uh-huh, uh-huh, nice junk in the trunk. Anyway, Sherlock Gnomes, this is the real meat and potatoes. With a name that clever and hilarious, how could it fail? If you want one good example of why this film failed, let me go to its IMDB page and show you what kind of images they have available to show off the movie. Oh god. Hmm. Somebody thought this was a good idea. Luckily for the hacks who made this movie, Sherlock Holmes is in the public domain, so the film effectively writes itself. You don't have to think of anything original. I didn't stop them from making some hilarious jokes about other possible titles or sequels though. I know! Game of no even the Gnome Ranger, oh, the Gnome Ranger. No. gets a shout out. Remember that? Nope. No, you don't. <laughs> what proceeds in the exact same way that Romeo and Juliet is just Romeo and Juliet with gnomes is a pretty typical Sherlock Holmes story, but every character, you guessed it, is a gnome. Because funny? What the f you know what, I'd be fine with a child-friendly animated Sherlock Holmes movie. Why do they have to be gnomes, exactly? Oh yeah, that's why. Of course, when you have Sherlock gnomes, you also have to have his arch-nemesis, Moriarty. Moriarty. Moriarty! They couldn't think of a funny pun for his name, so he's just Moriarty. Who in this film is a pie mascot, who often looks more like one of the emojis from the emoji movie than whatever he's supposed to be here. You enjoy our little game as much as I do. Once Gnomes defeats Moriarty in the opening scene, he's rude to Watson and then the sequence ends. My excitement levels couldn't quite control themselves when we were finally reintroduced to the beloved cast from the first movie. You got this hilarious one, and this guy, and how could I forget about this crazy mother right here? Oh! I'm okay! Excuse me. Oh, man, Keely, that is just... Are you done? Sorry, I'm just getting too hyped about this. It's hard to stay calm and collected when talking about my favorite gnomes from the... GCU. Whoever owns the gnomes moved house because they're in a new garden compared to the first one, and they no longer segregate gnome kind based on the color of their hats. There's a pretty important and totally justified subplot where one of the gnomes is in love with the annoying frog, but he doesn't tell her that he's in love with her because conflict. You need conflict. Oh, I think someone's got a crush on someone. Mm, maybe. This frog is probably the worst character in any movie. Freedom! She screams every line and just never shuts up. I just Please, be quiet. I knew kids are stupid, and this film is clearly made for stupid kids, but I reckon even baby IHE would have been pissed off by this frog. Frog bad. Frog very bad. Lord Redbrick and I are officially retiring. R retiring from what? 
What do you do, you're gnomes? The world building is so lazy in these gnome movies. And I know this might sound like a weird, ridiculous complaint considering what we're talking about here. But if you're going to be completely indifferent about the rules and regulations of this gnome universe, then why didn't you just make a straightforward Sherlock Holmes movie that was animated with humans? Because Sherlock Holmes is a human. The gnomes operate in a very similar way to how the toys in Toy Story do. The concept being that gnomes have their own society and have wars with each other and race lawnmowers around when they're not being looked at. But whereas Toy Story is consistent within the confines of its own rules, in the gnome universe pretty random things can just come to life depending on what funny scenes the writers could think of. If it was just gnomes then that would be fine I guess. But you got statues, gargoyles, and later on it just straight up turns into Toy Story. I know I probably harp on about this kind of thing way too much, but I find it genuinely frustrating when films are so transparently lazy about the way their rules and world building works. Watson and Gnomes have another argument and the true plot of the movie unravels. Garden Gnomes are being stolen from people's homes and it's up to Sherlock to find out where they've gone. Honestly, if you can get past the fact that Sherlock and Watson are Gnomes, the scenes with them are just fine. I do have a soft spot for these characters and the dynamic they have though. There are even some entertaining sequences where Sherlock goes into his mind palace, like in the BBC show. There's some nice 2D animation which makes me wish the whole film was just 2D animation, but that don't sell no more, so we got 3D. Nothing's particularly original, but at least it's something for me to latch onto, at least that is something with creative input. Nomeo and Juliet, however, who remember are actually in this movie, have nothing to do in the film at all. So their arc is that they fall out with each other because Juliet is more interested in cleaning the garden over spending time with Nomeo. There will be plenty of time for us after I get the garden ready. Unbelievable! Again, highlighting how there were clearly no ideas for this movie, so most of the time they just go through the motions. Movies need to have conflicts, so let's take the two characters who have absolutely nothing to do and put them through the same arc basically every character in any hack film like this goes through. Wow, that's really fun. It's really entertaining. The two sets of characters clash when the main set of gnomes is mysteriously stolen from the garden just before Sherlock arrives. From here, the film is basically just an episode of Sherlock, but with every character being a garden gnome, or other random ornaments or toys. Also, obviously, with Romeo and Juliet thrown in for good measure, because it had to be a sequel. There's an action scene in a sewer, a chase scene in Chinatown, a bunch of clues and mysteries are discovered. There's a strange scene where a doll has a musical number, and this isn't a musical. It's weirdly reminiscent of a scene from the terrible sci-fi film Valerian, that had Rihanna in it. Watson is killed by a gargoyle. <laughs> and then Nomeo gets kidnapped. However, we discover that the gnomes are all fine and are having a dance party, because it wouldn't be a bad animated movie without a bunch of dancing. But something even more dastardly is afoot. It's revealed that Watson was actually responsible for the gnomes disappearing all along. No, Sherlock, not Moriarty. Watson? Because he was just so sick of Sherlock ignoring him and not taking him seriously as a sidekick. And it was the only way to get him to pay attention. This was the only way to get through to Sherlock. Seems like a lot of work. But then in an even more surprising turn of events, it's revealed that the gargoyles don't actually work for Watson. They actually work for Moriarty, who didn't die at the beginning, so... To be fair, it is needlessly complicated, but that's what supervillains do. What the f so then there's a 20 minute action scene where Sherlock fights Moriarty and Nomeo and Juliet fly around on a drone. Of course they win, all the gnomes are returned home, and at 1 hour 17 minutes the film ends. Barely even a feature film. No sh Sherlock. Honestly, I'd be fine with the existence of this movie if they cut out all of the Nomeo and Juliet scenes and had it be a straight-to-DVD Sherlock Holmes 15 to 30 minute short for kids. But no, of course that's not enough. That doesn't have the potential of being profitable enough. Somehow, through some black magic, the people behind this film managed to make a film that's barely over an hour feel bloated and overly long. There was clearly no passion or creativity behind the inception of this movie. It's like it was made by an algorithm. A computer-generated product which only exists to try to squeeze out money from kids and grandmas. And this really is a grandma movie, with mostly safe, predictable humour, apart from a weird willy joke. Don't call me Tony D. And a nepotism one. Hooray 
for nepotism. I guess that's for the adults. With cute, adorable characters and not much at stake. I could imagine this being put on at Christmas for me when I was seven years old to try and keep me quiet for an hour. That's not really the kind of thing the production companies would put on the box art, would they? You're probably looking at this and wondering if this really is search for the worst worthy. I find it so inoffensive that it's kind of hard to get that angry over. This is probably mostly due to how competent the quality of the animation is. The fidelity, character design, aside from Moriarty who looks terrible. An expression in the animation is top notch considering the budget they had, especially considering the ridiculous voice cast they have. He probably collectively took half the budget. It can be annoyingly over-animated and strangely bare at points. Time! But the team of artists really had nothing to work with. The setting really is the most restrictive thing about it. It's so played out and overdone at this point that doing anything new and fresh with such a stagnant idea would require so much work that it wouldn't be worth it, considering the context of what we're talking about here. It's what irritates me the most about this film existing. Imagine this team of clearly capable animators being put to work on something spawned from an actual idea from creators with a passion and a story they actually wanted to tell. It's a film that exists out of obligation, a corporate predictable secretion straight from the bumhole of a money-hungry desperate studio. One of the more interesting aspects about this movie is that the appalling advertising might be what actually killed it in the end. There are certainly much worse films than this one that made plenty of money at the box office. If you've seen the trailer, you'll probably know what I mean. It's probably one of the worst trailers I've seen in recent years. They purposefully cut the footage to make the film look worse than it is, which I'm surprised didn't actually work. <laughs> what the f <laughs> too late. We'll need a ship. No ship, Sherlock. Is he even listening to me? He's not listening, look. That's not how a squirrel shakes its behind. Mankini, can you demonstrate? Oh, <laughs> For future reference, that's not how a squirrel wags its tail. This is. When I went to see Isle of Dogs in the cinema, the audience I was with laughed more at the trailer for Sherlock Gnomes than they did for the feature they were there to watch. So I thought this was going to be a slam dunk financially. I guess putting Sherlock Gnomes and Gnomeo and Juliet into posters of better and more famous movies somehow didn't make the film a success. Go figure. Sherlock Gnomes is about as good an idea as B-Movie, which despite the healthy amount of memes it spawned, is a baffling, creatively bankrupt abomination of a film that should have stayed being a two sentence long joke and nothing more. It leaves you with no questions other than why? Why did they sink so much money into this when it was a terrible idea from the get-go and it flopped as a result? Why did they get big name actors like Johnny Depp and Chiwetel Ejiofor for a movie like this? Why is every song in the movie an Elton John song? Why did anyone spend years assembling this pointless film about Sherlock Holmes gnomes? Why does this film exist? Thanks for watching. Subscribe. And subscribe to Jar Media and subscribe to Sardonicast. See ya.